A few years ago, Harish Natarajan was about to go on stage. He was going to engage in a public debate. Now, Harish is a world-class debater. He was a grand finalist at the 2016 World Debating Championships and the 2012 European Debating Champion. But this day was different. He had never taken on an opponent quite like this before. The day itself was a little bit odd to me in that it was in an auditorium in uh, California, in San Francisco. And I would walk into that auditorium and there were maybe 500 computers um, all uh, backstage. And there was a, a table where I think like five people with different laptops and then the monolith. The monolith. Literally the 2001 version of a monolith. There on the stage, standing tall, was a sleek black slab with just a few animated circles sliding around the top edge of the screen like a three-shell game. There's a, it's a fact of intimidation, which is like, I'm one person walking here, more or less, less by myself, you know, talking to some people who I know, but really I'm by myself and there's this entire machine, not just a machine, a ecosystem of laptops and computers cameras, which will give you the idea that that's what you're up against. This imposing piece of technology was the newest artificial intelligence project from IBM, Project Debater. 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 A computer, just wires, ones and zeros, that could apparently debate a person live on any topic with just a few minutes prep time all while speaking with a confident, feminine voice. I am a true believer in the power of technology, as I should be, being myself a prime example of its power. And this is like IBM's thing. <laughs> they have this tradition of challenges to build artificial intelligence to destroy humans at things only humans should be good at. Back in the 80s, they started designing Deep Blue, which was able to beat a chess grandmaster in 1997. Then in 2011, Project Watson pummeled trivia champs Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter on the popular game show Jeopardy. And it's not just IBM. In 2015, the company DeepMind developed AlphaGo, which was able to beat a champion player of the complex board game Go. But debate feels different. Like, sure, chess and Go have some clear rules, and a computer could feasibly map out a path to victory. And trivia, like, sure, a computer hooked up to a ton of information could quickly pull up the answers to these questions. I, I mean, I'm making it sound simple. These projects actually took years and engineers faced about a million challenges pulling it off. But it's at least conceivable that a computer could do those things. You know how you win a game of Go. You know how you win a game of chess. You can mathematically write that down. But going head to head in a debate against another human who could make any argument, play on your emotions, develop a complex and compelling thread of logic? Could a computer really pull that off? My presumption had been that, you know, there's just so much involved in debating, which is difficult for a machine to do. In some ways, more difficult than Go and more difficult than chess. So I walked in with the idea that, yeah, I, I don't, think that it's easy for a machine to do really well in all of these aspects of debating. It just seems to be, to be co too complicated. And the second thought, which is, yeah, but didn't all the chess grandmasters think that in 1997? Didn't all the ghost players think that in 2015? And the realization that uh, my intuition says it shouldn't be able to win, but how many chess grandmasters would have responded by saying, chess is something which is uniquely human, and machines will not be able to compete. We were very nervous when the debate started because we really didn't know it was a one, one single debate. We didn't know how Harish would re react. We didn't know how the system would respond to Harish. That's Noam Slonim. He's the engineer at IBM who came up with the idea for Project Debater and led the team that developed the technology. There was a lot of uncertainties, and this is a live event. We didn't have a lot of time even to, you know, to set the, the audio system in the venue. So, you know, even these little things 
At some point, we had a meeting with, with the head of IBM Research at the time, who is today the CEO of, of the company. And he told us, you know, but eventually it's the cables that, that fail, right? Someone forgot to plug in the, the network cable or, or the audio cable, and that's it, right? Even something like that can certainly happen. You don't have a, a second shot. You're listening to Opinion Science, the show about our opinions, where they come from, and how they change. I'm Andy Luttrell, and this week we meet Project Debater through the people who created and debated her. I first came across this in a brief column in The New Yorker, and as a guy who studies persuasion for a living, I was like, there's no way. <laughs> like, how could it possibly work? A computer program that can not only pull information about some topic, but also somehow turn that information into persuasive arguments, either for or against an issue, and also somehow listen to a human understand their arguments and rebut them. So I, I dug into it, and the technology is incredible. And we'll get to that stuff in a bit, but I also had a bigger question. Like, I kind of feel like persuasion is a fundamentally human thing. It's about human beings relating to each other, influencing each other, getting in each other's heads. And, and let's say a computer is able to technically debate a person. Is that just an, an illusion? Is persuasion still fundamentally human? Or is what Project Debater is doing just as much persuasion as anything else you or I could do? So we'll take a look at Project Debater's struggles in the early days how it tried to crack the code of debates, and what happened when it went head-to-head -head against human debaters in public events. Then we'll explore what neuroscience tells us about whether persuasion is fundamentally human, or whether it's something a machine is truly capable of. Dan Zafrir was a college debater in Israel when he was invited to help IBM develop their new AI system. They invited him to their office in Tel Aviv. It's a very small office in a very nondescript office building in a strange neighborhood where you wouldn't expect to find IBM necessarily. I walked in and very true to Israeli spirit, it felt like just a very casual office where everybody was walking around in flip-flops and shorts and kind of sitting around their computers on poofs. And, you know, it was really chill and funny. And the team was extremely welcoming. When it came time to actually debate the prototype for the first time, they took Dan to this tiny little conference room. Which also serves as like the shelter in that building. So it was like this huge safe-like door and soundproof walls and like quite crammed and we were all, you know, squeezed into this little dark room with no windows to get the acoustics just right. I don't remember what we were debating, but um, I remember a lot of sitting around and waiting for it to reboot, waiting for them to tweak this, waiting for them to turn that button. And that's kind of how it was for a long time. I truly did hundreds of debates. Uh, to be honest, it was grueling at the beginning too, because we had to, it has to draw on so much data to be able to debate anything. So I debated hundreds of topics for and against, recording myself every single time. It was very rusty in the beginning. It was a lot of, you know, technical malfunctions and very inappropriate jokes by the little machine that could. Like for example, it would argue for a motion that was supposed to argue against or it would cite the wrong pieces of evidence. Like, I don't know, let's say we were debating arts and sciences in school and it would go off on a tangent on something unrelated to science and like this piece of research that has nothing to do with school policy or funding or anything like that. But it was those kinds of things. It was really elementary stuff. At some point during the project, after uh, three and a half years of, of work, the results were not good. That last voice is Noam Slonim again, the guy who led the team at IBM. We were not even able to generate a sensible opening speech, but 
I knew that there are concrete things that we can do that can significantly boost the performance of the system. Uh, so, and, and I was concerned that this will stop at that point because, okay, it's a large team. You work for three and a half years. The numbers do not improve uh, fast enough, not, not even close. So what, 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 is the, what is the plan? The plan was just to keep going. And then things started looking up. And indeed, in 2016, we saw a very significant improvement in the performance of the system. Before we start to peek under the hood of Project Debater to see how it actually figured out how to debate people, let's back up a little bit. Where did the idea to build an AI debater come from anyway? I mentioned earlier that IBM has this history of grand challenges, building machines to beat champion chess players, that sort of thing. And in 2011, they debuted a machine that was about to play Jeopardy and win against the best players in the show's history. Watson. What is clock? Clock is correct. And with that, you move up to 23,440. So just a few days after the big win on Jeopardy, IBM sends out an email to its researchers around the world that basically said, um, so what should we do next? So I asked my office mate, do we want to brainstorm together? And he said, sure, why not? And, and we sat in the office in Tel Aviv and we raised many different ideas, nothing really meaningful. But uh, at some point towards the end of the hour, I suggested this notion of developing a machine that can debate humans. Now, this didn't truly come out of nowhere. Debate has always been a subject that has occupied Noam's attention. I think I grew up in a house where uh, there was a lot of appreciation for writing skills and debating skills. And uh, during my, my uh, PhD studies, I found myself actually writing TV scripts first for a comedy show and then for a sitcom that I co-created with, with a, a friend of mine. And interestingly enough, the, the final episode of this uh, sitcom was about uh, competitive debates. But, but this episode was written at the late 90s, 12 years before I, I proposed to pursue Project Debater. So he and his office mate knocked around a few more ideas, never came up with anything they were too jazzed about, and so they just submitted the debate idea. To my surprise, and also to my panic, this was eventually selected as, as the next grand challenge of IBM Research. This was a year later. When you submitted the idea of an AI debater, how confident were you that it was possible? Like, did you go, yeah, I'm, you know, with enough time we could do this, or were you like, there's a good chance this is actually impossible? This is, a, this is an interesting uh, point, because um, if you're confident, if you're fully confident that this is doable, this is not a grand challenge. And on the other extreme, if you're confident that this is not doable, then probably you should not start. So it should be somewhere in between. And it was not only me. We, we were a, a large team of researchers working on that together. And I would say many of the researchers in the team were concerned that this will never happen because people are working very hard on that. We know that the management uh, are, are very much invested in that. And we know that we are expected to deliver but uh, we are far from confident that this will happen. It took a while, like, <laughs> like a long while, but eventually the system started to get better. It stopped making such simple mistakes and it was actually able to hold its own in a debate. And after many, many years of work, it seemed like they were finally onto something. I was kind of proud of being, of being the first one to lose to that machine wow, that's kind of cool. Like, I mean, if you if you will mark the beginning of the decline of humanity and the rise of the machines, I guess I will be kind of the pivotal point where we started losing. <laughs> 
Okay, so how exactly can a computer successfully debate? We'll, we'll leave the nitty gritty stuff for the computer scientists, but basically there are a few key steps to pulling this off. First, once Project Debater gets the debate topic, it gets to work consulting a massive collection of around 400 million newspaper articles. We're talking billions of sentences about, like, everything. And to pull out the few bits of information that are relevant, the system uses what computer scientists call argument mining. Essentially, this means that the system finds articles relevant to the debate topic, breaks those articles into chunks, pulls out the sentences that are most likely to contain arguments, and identifies the opinion that those sentences convey. This is the foundation of the evidence Project Debater will use. But there's another trick up its sleeve, or um, it, its motherboard. Some top human debater in Israel told us, look, if, if I'm debating whether or not to ban the sale of alcohol or whether or not to ban organ trade, it's the same debate. It doesn't matter. In most cases, a human debater has only a few minutes to prepare, and they don't have a giant index of articles in their brain. But they have enough experience to know that there are some core argumentation strategies that they can deploy for all sorts of topics. These are called principled arguments. These are things like arguing that you shouldn't play God with nature, or that the resolution is an affront to our freedom of choice. They aren't topic specific. You, you could plug them into lots of debates. So. Project Debater pulls evidence from a bunch of articles, checks a bank of principled arguments to find any that might be relevant, stitches all that stuff together, you throw a pleasant voice on it, and voila, you have an opening speech. But the debate's not over. The opponent also gives an opening speech, and Project Debater has to rebut it. I would say this was probably the most challenging part. Because even though Project Debater is able to record and transcribe its opponent's speech, how is it able to pick it apart and figure out what they argued? Well, just like human debaters learn by studying the greats, Project Debater had some homework to do. Over, over the years, we recruited a small team of expert debaters and we were asking them to debate one another without ever meeting face to face. We were sending them uh, a debate topic and then this expert human debater is receiving the debate topic and the guidance are, well, you have 10 minutes to prepare and then you need to record an opening speech of around uh, four minutes. And then we take this speech and we send it to someone else, perhaps in a different continent. And, and the guidance to this person is, you know, you have 10 minutes to prepare, then you need to listen to this opening speech, and then you need to record a rebuttal. And, and in this way, we collected thousands of, of debate speeches. And, and I'm always uh, amused by that, because these people were debating each other, never meeting face to face. At some point, one of them told me, you know, I met the other guy. We were in a conference, and finally we met. After we, I, I recognized his voice. And, and this is the person I was debating uh, over the mail. They would transcribe all of these debates and have people use their human eyes and brains to essentially teach Project Debater how to look for a speech's arguments so it knows how to respond to them. On honestly, I'm obviously only scratching the surface of how this insanely complicated process works, but I think you get the gist. And it it's really incredible, because this whole project was just one innovation after another from an insanely talented group. So by now, Project Debater is killing it. It's had tons of practice, the engineers have smoothed out all sorts of bumps, and now it's time to take this show on the road. To San Francisco, specifically. In 2018, IBM set up a public demonstration of the Project Debater technology. A small crowd would gather to watch a computer go up against two debaters, our buddy Dan Zafrir, and someone we have not met yet in our story. Uh, my name is Noah Ovadia. I'm currently a high school civics teacher, but for a few years I was a university debater. Two debates, two topics, 
two human debaters. It was a live demo, so anything could happen. First, Noah takes the stage. The resolution? That we should subsidize space exploration. Project Debater would be arguing for subsidies, and Noah would be arguing against them. But before the debate begins, they poll the audience. What's their initial opinion? 60% of this audience said at the very beginning that they already agreed with space exploration subsidies. And in these public demonstrations, this information is really important because it's how they're able to decide who wins the debate. And then the winner was really who was able to sway the most opinions given the arguments that they gave. So they pull the audience on the issue before the debate starts, and then they'll pull them again afterward to see who's able to move more opinions. And now that the initial polling is in, it's time for opening arguments. I would suggest that we should subsidize space exploration. Let me start with a few words of background. Space exploration. This debate is about if this is an appropriate allocation of government funds. And what I'm going to show you in my speech is explain when the government should subsidize something. And rebuttals. Thank you. Allow me to respond to some of my opponent's most recent claims. I think that one of the claims made by Ms. Avalia... We haven't yet heard evidence that shows us why it would benefit all of society. Perhaps some parts of society, maybe upper middle class... And closing arguments. We should subsidize space exploration. I thank you for your time. We don't understand why we need to specifically fund space. Given the fact that we should definitely be spending government money on other things, we beg you to oppose this motion. And then they poll the audience's opinion on the issue again. When the data were tallied, it was clear that um, most, most people didn't change their opinion at all. But after hearing the debate, a few people who started out on Project Debater's side were no longer so sure that subsidizing space exploration was so great. Our human debater, Noah, was able to sway the audience. What was going through your head at the moment? Oh, it was really kind of empty. Like, it's like it just really just felt like we're still, we've done the bare minimum of remaining more advanced than AI for the time being. Like, it was really, there wasn't like a huge sense of pride or relief or anything like that. Um, no, it was not like it was nice to win, just like it's always nice to, to win. But IBM was also measuring another aspect of the debate. But they asked them another question as well. Could you describe what that was and how you did on that one? I think it was who's the most persuasive, but I'm not, I don't recall actually. I think, so it's, it's. Um, I think who did you learn the most from? Oh, okay. Okay. And did I lose that one? Yes, you did. <laughs> do you have a selective memory? Yeah. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, so as far as you're right. concerned, you, you demolished this machine. <laughs> so you have the statistics, and I have the feeling, the memory, what it was like, the selectivity of, you know, writing that. <laughs> yeah, in the audience survey, they asked, who better enriched your knowledge? And Project Debater crushed it on this front. And this is a recurring theme. Wh whatever you say about Project Debater's persuasion ability, there is no doubt that having access to a zillion news articles gives you a leg up on being informative. You know, when you're asked a leading question, who did you learn the, mo <laughs> the most? <laughs> I'm taking it really hard. I think I really just erased it from my mind. Um, no. So at least when it came to swaying the audience's opinions, a human debater was still able to come out as more persuasive. Now it was Danza Freer's turn. Noah moderated this next debate. The topic we have before us is increasing the use of telemedicine. They poll the audience. Thank you all for voting. And the debate begins. Project Debater is arguing that we should increase the use of telemedicine. With Dan Zafrier arguing the other side. I beg you to oppose this motion. Opening arguments, rebuttal, closing statements, and the audience gives their final opinions. So just like with Noah's debate, People far and away said that Project Debater was more informative. But when it came to whose opinions changed... Okay, this is uh, very interesting. Before the debate, 
59% of the audience said that they agreed with increasing the use of telemedicine, which is the side that Project Debater would argue. Only 7% disagreed with the motion, as Dan would go on to argue. The rest were undecided. After the debate, 7% still disagree with the motion. Dan did not pull anyone new to his side. But almost half of the undecided audience ended up supporting increases in telemedicine. So that's a very, very good result for Project Debater. Project Debater, a computer program, I mean, a very expensive and sophisticated computer program, but with no previous understanding of telemedicine, was able to convince actual human people that we should be increasing our use of this service. But a human debater wasn't able to convince anyone that telemedicine wasn't worth investing in. I didn't like what I was arguing for anyway, so I was like, well, good for the machine. And here's the thing, Dan is a good debater. Like, Project Debater was built on his debating. But it had just hit a point where it could, at least sometimes, do better. But fortunately, it sounds like there are no hard feelings. Yes, oh, I love her. She's a woman, strong, confident woman. Okay, so Project Debater made a strong debut in 2018, persuading more people than Dan Safrier and only narrowly losing to Noah Ovadia. But this was to a reasonably small crowd. It was time for Project Debater's big introduction to the world. She was about to go live at Intelligence Squared US. Since 2006, we have put on, across the nation, close to 170 debates. By the way, before I ever heard about Project Debater, I was already a fan of Intelligence Squared US. You can listen to their podcast for thought-provoking debates on a bunch of important issues by leading experts in those fields. All of them human. But this time it was different. A world champion debater would go up against a computer in a debate broadcast to the whole world. A live audience fills the auditorium. Harish Natarajan is backstage. The debate topic, the resolution, was about to be announced. Neither Harish nor Project Debater had gotten that information before, and they both had just 15 minutes to prepare. Tonight's resolution... We should subsidize preschool. We should subsidize preschool. When I heard that motion, I'm speaking in opposition, I was mortified. I had no idea why this was going to be controversial and why this was plausibly a controversial topic. But the, the time was on the clock, so Harish prepares his notes. He'll argue that we should not subsidize preschool. Project Debater does what it does, preparing to argue that we should subsidize preschool. And after 15 minutes, Harish walks on stage to argue the issues with an inanimate black slab. The monolith. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go, Project Debater. Greetings, Harish. I have heard you hold the world record in debate competition wins against humans, but I suspect you've never debated a machine. <laughs> Welcome to the future. <laughs> I will argue that we should subsidize preschools. We are going to talk about financial issues. So Project Debater essentially argues that we have a moral duty to invest in preschools because they serve a greater societal good. And here's where she does her thing, citing a mound of concrete evidence without batting an eye, if, if she had an eye. Final issue. A study by the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research shows that attention- Here is a study from New Jersey that is worth noting. In New Jersey, the follow-up to the Abbott the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that universal full-day preschool creates the results of a new study of over 1,000 identical and fraternal twins published in Psychological Science, a journal of the Association for Psychological Science. Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, Project Debater. Harish's turn. And his play is basically to say, listen, whatever you think about preschool and the good that it serves, the reality is that these programs tend to give unfair and ex uh, exaggerated gains to those individuals in the middle class. But just as concerning... The people you don't help are those individuals who are the poorest. You give and the debate continues. Each side gets a chance to respond to the other and make their concluding remarks. Starters, I sometimes listen to opponents in wonder. 
What do they want? Would they prefer poor people on their doorsteps begging for money? Would they live well with poor people without heating and running water? And like, I, I keep thinking that this experience had to be super bizarre for Harish. But he was like, I mean... The first 15, 30 seconds of a machine talking. Those were weird. But after just a little while, it felt like any other debate. I'm just listening to what they're saying, processing the arguments, and thinking what I say about them, and how I fit that into my speech. And Project Debater might have found it weird at first, too. Although the machine had been trained on so many human debates, according to Noam Slonim, one thing that made Harish unique was his... Very fine British accent, so we needed to do some, uh, some adjustments to handle that in, in the last minute. After 30 minutes of back and forth between Harish and Project Debater, it was all over. Now it's up to the audience. So um, we're on our way to making history here. Choose your position where you stand now that you've heard the arguments from both sides. Um, and please. Of course, we wanted to win. Of course, we wanted to win because this is the game. No one likes losing. And I, I would have hated the idea of losing. The world was watching. When facing off against a world champion debater, could Project Debater, after years of development, thousands of practice debates, access to a treasure trove of knowledge, could it be more persuasive than a human? So first, when it came to the question of who most enriched the audience's knowledge, survey says, Project Debater better enriched the knowledge of the audience on that side. So. But, but like, okay, that's always been Project Debater's strength. When it came to swaying the audience's opinion, though, before the debate even started, 79% of you agreed with the resolution, 13% disagreed, 8% were undecided. So Project Debater's side already had quite a bit of support. Harish's side was not popular to begin with. After the debate, only 62% of the audience still agreed with subsidizing preschools. Meaning Project Debater lost 17 percentage points and now, 30% of the audience disagreed with subsidizing preschool. The position that Harish argued. He pulled up 17 percentage points. That is it. Harish Natarajan arguing against. Harish won the debate. In its grand debut on a world stage, Project Debater had lost in a game of persuasion. And despite its fleeting win against Dan Zafrir a year earlier, this is the typical outcome of these public debates. I am. I think the only human who was actually lost to the machine. Now, Project Debater is still young. It was, what, like nine years old when it faced off against Harish? She is way smarter than I was <laughs> when I was nine. So the future may still hold promise, whatever the results of this debate were. It's very plausible that a machine will be able to out-debate a human being, to be more persuasive to a human audience than a human who has a lot of practice at debating. Maybe that point is in 2025, maybe it's 2050. But I suspect that time will come, or at least it's very plausible that it will come. Um, and I'm, I'm okay with that idea. And, and now we know at least that it wasn't you, that it was able to be. So you've cleared, <laughs> yeah, you've cleared I, I, it. Yeah, <laughs> I've cleared it. You know, like the, the optimal solution for me is the next public debate, um, IBM wins. It's like, yep, yeah, but I still won. Right. <laughs> You were you were the the thing that really led it to up its game, right? It was secretly you that that, it, that it definitely <laughs> or, or helping the machines become more and more powerful. When I first heard about Project Debater and the results of that debate with Harish Natarajan, my immediate reaction was, of course. Persuasion is human. It's a sophisticated social process. A machine could never master that. Not really anyway, right? And now that I've known more about how Project Debater works, I thought that one way I could get some answers to this bigger question was to look into the brains of persuaders. Our, our brains are obviously human. <laughs> They're a marvel and the inspiration for plenty of challenges in computer science. 
So I talked to someone who has looked at persuaders' brains. Alyssa Beck is a postdoctoral fellow at UCLA. She's a communication neuroscientist. So when I was in undergrad, I was actually a double major in communication and cognitive neuroscience. And there was absolutely no overlap in my mind or the coursework at all between the two majors. But as luck would have it, she heard about this researcher, Emily Falk, who had been using neuroscience to study communication at the University of Pennsylvania. They could use brain imaging to answer questions like, what makes messages more persuasive? And which health messages can actually get people to quit smoking? But beyond looking at people's brains when they receive persuasive information, what if we look at people's brains when they're in the role of persuader? There are a few parts of the brain that are worth getting to know a little better. The medial prefrontal cortex, the temporal parietal junction, precuneus, superior temporal sulcus, and temporal poles. These sections of the brain matter because they make up what neuroscientists call the mentalizing system. Mentalizing is a very cool thing that human brains can do. Ba basically, it's our ability to understand the invisible states of mind that underlie the behaviors we can see. That includes understanding our own inner minds, but also the inner minds of others. And, and maybe that sounds simple, but it is mind-blowing. I have a nine-month-old daughter, and she can't really do this yet. She sees me and likes when I'm around, but she doesn't really understand that I have my own brain that's having its own thoughts. Instead, when she wants to play, she's like, I don't know, my best guess is that this dude wants to play too. But when we can appreciate that other people have their own unique thoughts and beliefs, we get the ability to take their perspective. And it's this part that's key to persuasion. For example, the more a salesperson is able to accurately perceive and understand other people's emotions, in other words, the more they have emotional intelligence, the more they can get in another person's head, the more successful they are in sales. And like, let's actually look inside of people's brains. One study had participants imagine that they were interns at a TV studio. They saw a bunch of ideas for TV shows and thought about how they would pitch those ideas to TV producers. Another group of participants played the role of the producers, and they saw video recordings of the first group's pitches. And this was done at UCLA, so I think a lot of people in LA are already in this mindset that they're familiar with things like this, like TV shows and producing them. But when those interns thought about the TV show ideas for the first time, they were in giant brain scanners. And when researchers looked at this brain data, they found that the interns who ended up being the most persuasive, the ones who got producers to agree with them about the show's promise, the mentalizing systems in their brains, they were working harder when they first encountered the TV show ideas. In other words, this part of the human brain that is so fundamental to how we engage with other people, it plays a critical role in our ability to be persuasive. Which makes sense, right? Like, for us to make a connection, we need to understand what's going on in the minds of the people we're communicating with. I think intuitively we do this all the time. You know, last weekend, um, I was trying to convince a couple of friends to go camping with me. And immediately you think, like, oh, um, for this person, I'm going to tailor my communication in this way. So, like, one of my friends is really into nature. And so for that friend, it's, like, it's a great way to get away from the city and become one with nature. You're going to hear the birds sing in the morning, and that's how you're going to wake up, right? Whereas another friend might care less about that, but wanted to really bond with friends. And I might emphasize, like, oh, the campfire moments are really great for bonding. Um, you're going to have a lot of fun time with us, like, connecting in this new environment. So I feel like that's just like one example of how intuitively we're engaging in mentalizing when we think about influencing or persuading other people in everyday context, because we think that that's going to make us more persuasive or lead to a higher chance of success in persuasion. And th this idea that perspective taking is key to persuasion, it reminded me of something Harish Natarajan said to me about the secrets of successful debating. To me, a large part of debating is not about disagreement, but it's about finding agreement. We want to agree on as much as we can so we can pinpoint the disagreement. From a rhetorical perspective, I find this to be useful because it's, I'm trying to be reasonable. I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to give you credit. Are you now willing to give me credit? And one thing which I think 
project debater struggles to do is that, which is actually what do we disagree on and what do we agree on? And actually finding that zones of agreement can be much more powerful in a debate or even in a conversation than trying to make everything about disagreement. Finding zones of agreement. That requires perspective taking. In fact, there's this study from the psychologist Adam Galinsky and his colleagues showing this for negotiations. Negotiators who are good at taking other people's perspective are often more effective because they're better at finding those hidden points of agreement. So for all sorts of reasons, mentalizing and perspective taking seem key to persuasion, debate, negotiation, and these are like baked into the human brain. They're sophisticated social abilities. A machine could never truly pull this off. To persuade is human, right? I think to a certain degree, um, computers might already be mentalizing, um, <laughs> which might sound a little bit crazy. But if we think of the mentalizing system in the human brain as simply something that forms, holds, and helps us retrieve mental representations of other human beings, don't you think that my phone, which tracks everything that I do, every click that I make, every photo that I like, every search that I Google, and every purchase that I make, might have already a mental representation of me that may be more accurate, even, uh, one could argue, than my friend. Therefore, the phone could, in theory, be better at persuading me to let's like make a purchase or something like that um because it's like real-time updating um it has all the i mean in theory this is all in theory but it has a mental representation of me for many years now and it also has a pretty accurate perhaps read of where my state is at this very second better than a human friend could so uh, anyway, like that might sound crazy, but I was like, isn't it, it, if we just define the mentalizing system as something that just represents another person's mind and uses it, don't our phones already have sort of that capability to do so, right? Is that crazy? <laughs> no, not at all. It makes perfect sense. Of course a machine can mentalize. <laughs> Just because a human brain can do something doesn't mean a machine couldn't someday come along and do exactly that and do it better. Maybe there isn't anything uniquely human about persuasion after all. But maybe I went at this wrong. Maybe the question isn't so much about whether a machine is capable of persuasion, but it's more a question of whether we would let ourselves be swayed by a computer. After all, Project Debater made no attempt to cover up her true self, as IBM engineer Noam Slonim acknowledges. It was never uh, trying to pretend to be human. It has its own style, it has its own persona, and it is very open about being an, an automatic machine. I admit this is stressful. I've been told it helps to take a deep breath, but unfortunately I cannot do that. And, you know, sometimes this might not even matter. Like, sometimes we are looking for the most rational, factual stance to take on an issue. And if we know that some AI system has lightning fast access to all recorded knowledge, then we may be perfectly happy being swayed by its conclusion. But that's not always what we're looking for. Back in 1960, the psychologist Daniel Katz proposed that people form opinions for different reasons. And sure, Sometimes the goal is just to arrive at the objectively correct stance on some issue. But sometimes opinions serve what Katz called social adjustive functions. In other words, we don't always form opinions to be right. We form them to fit in. Alyssa Beck again. As humans, we have such a strong need to socially belong and connect with others. And so I think because of those factors, as people being persuaded, I think people are more persuaded by other humans because they have this need. So like sometimes you would say yes to that camping trip, even though you hate everything about it because you love your friends, right? And a machine just doesn't have that factor for us. So I still think that um, even if the machine can perfect the mentalizing network, let's say, and do it better, 
I think at the end of the day, a human might still win out because for the person being persuaded, there's so much more than just the strategies that are involved in persuasion, right? It has the human connection. Like sometimes we get influenced by complete strangers just because of that need to connect with others and the reciprocity that's involved. So is persuasion fundamentally human? In the end, I'm not really convinced that this was ever really a reasonable question. I mean, I think Alyssa Beck made a great point that an AI system would struggle to meet people's social needs to belong. And all the debaters I talked to had their own ideas about why AI would never be able to master every aspect of debate. And, you know, the thing I also keep coming back to is like Project Debater only exists because of humans. It draws on human knowledge, it was programmed by humans, it learned to debate by watching humans debate, but still. Does the philosophical question of whether persuasion is fundamentally human even matter? I, I talked to the author Daniel Pink for the podcast a few weeks ago, and I mentioned this story to him after we wrapped up our interview. I was like, there's this cool AI project that IBM has been working on, and it's able to debate against humans, and it raises this compelling philosophical question of whether persuasion is fundamentally human. And he was like, <laughs> something could be fundamentally human and a machine could do it. You know, the, I mean, the machines do. Um, OK, I'll give you. OK, here we go. Poetry is, is writing poetry fundamentally human. Absolutely. Can a machine write poetry? Yeah. That, I don't think that negates the first claim. To me, it's like I, 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 I'm not I'm not that dismayed by the two things existing side by side. Yeah. The more I've, I've been looking into the story, the more I realize, like, yeah, I, I mean, Maybe we should not be troubled by this, right? Like, right. maybe we should, it, it is not threatening that a machine could debate a person. Right, any, any, any more than we should be troubled by the fact that a machine can add, subtract, multiply, and divide and do square roots faster than we can. Or, or play chess against a grandmaster. Right, exactly. I mean, if, I mean, playing chess is like, does that mean that like, people should never play chess again? Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> right. play chess. But just don't play against a computer. <laughs> yeah, just don't play against a powerful computer, exactly. And actually... The question of whether persuasion is uniquely human distracts us from the completely bonkers, amazing success of Project Debater. Like, okay, sure, maybe it's not crushing humans at debate every time, but it's also not losing horribly. A computer made a strong showing against a world champion debater in a live event. That is bananas. Should we even care who won? I had a lot of opportunities to tell the, the story of the journey of Project Debater in many technical talks, in, in many different conferences, and so on. And at some point, I noticed nobody asks who won the debate. I, I, I have this build up, and I'm telling them the story, and then I show a short segment of the debate, and then uh, I start to talk about how the system actually works and, and all the technical details, and so on. And then Nobody asks. Then we go to the Q&A. No one asks. And, and I, at some point, I was actually approaching the audience. Why don't you ask? I mean, do, aren't you curious? And, and they say, yes, well, fine. I mean, we are. But you, you, you know that people somehow understand that this is not the important part. And, and this was very encouraging uh, to see. I think the point here was really to demonstrate that, that an AI system can meaningfully participate in, in such an event. And, uh, and I think the, this is what we accomplished. All right, that'll do it for this episode of Opinion Science, episode 50, <laughs> 50 episodes of this project and still going. Thank you to all your support for the show and for listening in. Uh, it, it really means a lot. Um, I want to give a huge thanks to all of the people who talked to me for this episode, including Noam Slonim, Harish Nadarajan, Dan Zafrir, Noah Ovadia, Alyssa Beck, and Daniel Pink. And also thank you to Chris Sayaka at IBM. I've never spoken with him directly, so I think I'm mispronouncing his name, but he put me in touch with a bunch of the folks you heard from, and he set me up with recordings of the live debates, so giant thank you to Chris. 
You can check out past episodes of Opinion Science at opinionsciencepodcast.com and subscribing uh, on any of the major podcast apps. You can also follow the show at Opinion SciPod on Twitter and Facebook. And if you enjoyed the show, leave a review online somewhere. Apple Podcasts is a good place to go. But wherever you get podcasts, if you can leave a review or spread the word somehow, please do. It helps people find the show. Okie doke. In a couple weeks, uh, we'll hear a little more from the debaters you heard from today. When I talked to them, I also asked for their thoughts on the value of debate for society. So come back next time to hear what they said. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you for being here, and I will see you next time for more Opinion Science. Bye-bye.